Good evening and welcome to you all and I understand I've seen the weather map tonight and I know that many of you are under tornado watches if not worse and some I'm sure have not come on tonight because of it and so right now in the name Lord Jesus Christ we declare that we are your children children who are under your shadow and protection and we now ask that your hand of covering your wall of protection your shield shall be around everyone that is in this room tonight and upon those that have not checked in because of this very thing so we call your blessing into the entire weather system of the United States in the name of him who is Lord of heaven and earth Lord Jesus Christ and we now receive your blessing flowing through each one of us as we come to your word amen and amen and <clears throat> it is good to have those of you here that are here tonight and we come to this very important part of the psalm in fact some of you have been waiting for it verse 4 of Psalm 23 even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I fear no evil for thou art with me thy rod and thy staff they comfort me <clears throat> that's where we're beginning tonight anyway there's so much in this text that we might be here for uh, more than one or maybe two weeks and so let's plunge right into it I don't know if you realize it but there's a break here in fact I, I don't know if it's in your Bible but mine actually gives an extra space between verse 3 and 4 there's something happens here it would almost be true to say that verses 1 2 and 3 are an introduction in which David has been musing on how the Lord has been his shepherd throughout all his life and, and as he looks back and right to close days he, he speaks of him as lacking nothing as lying down in green pastures led by still waters soul restored led in paths of righteousness this is his track record with the Lord his shepherd and in those first three verses you could say he's reporting he's giving a testimony have you noted uh, the personal pronouns here he, in those first three verses it, it's David saying he the shepherd he he he's telling you about him the shepherd and, and so it, it's he makes me lie down he leads me beside still waters he restores my soul he, he's talking to us about him the shepherd and, and so in that sense it's um as i said it, it's a report on the faithfulness of the shepherd it, it's a testimony of how david has walked with this shepherd and this is his statement uh, to us all that this is the way it is with the shepherd but now the tone changes as I say that becomes very much like an introduction now it changes and it's as if you're you're out of it now it's just David and the shepherd he's no longer telling us about him but he's speaking directly to the shepherd he is having a, a moment of intimacy in his heart with the shepherd and now it is though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I fear no evil for thou or you are with me it's no longer about him it's rather speaking directly immediately to him and saying you are with me and so it goes on through the rest of the psalm uh, until the end and then again there's a slight change but the, the, this I would say then 
we have come to the very heart of the psalm. And so, first thing, and it, it's only just a, an aside, really, but it's, it's right in your face here, that the pressures of life, and obviously David is speaking about pressures supreme, but the pressures of life produce not only a track record with the Lord, you know what I mean? Now you can say with assurance, I've been there, I've done that, I know it by my own personal experience, He is this, He is that. It's our track record embedded into our personal history with the Lord. And, and that's what David speaks of in Psalm 103, when, when he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all his benefits. That is, don't forget what the Lord has been to you. Don't forget how he has intervened in your life. Don't forget the overflowing blessings that have been yours, our track record. But I say, it's not only a track record, but there is an intimacy and a personal, immediately knowing of the shepherd under life's pressures that we do not experience without those pressures. I, I think it's true to say that you have met with God and you know him. That is, you didn't hear some, you, it's not hearsay. It's not something that you heard someone else testify about. It's not something you read in a book. It is your immediate and personal experience. It's when we move from he does this to you are with me. You see the difference here. It's in, in the living of life, the daily living of life with all of its ups and downs, that's where we come to really know him. Now, what David is going through in our Bible, and it's in most of our Bibles that you might have in front of you, in mine here, the New American Standard, it says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And that, that's true back through the most um, versions that we have. Now, in the margin of my Bible, it says, Though I walk through the valley of deep darkness. Though I walk through the valley of deep darkness. And the Jewish Bible um, puts it like this. Even if I pass through death-dark ravines, I will fear no disaster, for you are with me. death dark ravines, valley of the shadow of death. Okay, the Amplified Version, it has it, though I walk through the deep, sunless valley of the shadow of death, I will dread no evil. Okay, what is this? The valley of the shadow of death. Now, the word there, it's, it's one word, uh, at which we've translated shadow of death. It's made up of two Hebrew words, and the first half means shadow, and the second half means death, uh, from which we've translated shadow of death. But the emphasis is on the shadow part of it, or the dark part of it. A and, in fact, there are some versions that leave out the death and simply say the valley of deep darkness, the valley of thick shadow or whatever. And so as we, we toy with the word death, we are emphasizing the word shadow with its ideas of darkness. And so we could, now I'm going to take some little time here, because of this, this phrase is of vital importance. It, it, it could mean... Death shadow. Feel, feel these, because these are all real possibilities of what this word means in English. Death shadow, <coughs> or deep shadow, or shadow of death. Well, that, that's pretty obvious from a deep shadow, a death shadow, shadow of death. But then it could mean thick darkness, or thick gloom 
or deep darkness, a very deep shadow. Um, as you go through the scripture, this word is used more than once in the scripture, and it's used to describe physical darkness. You remember when Pharaoh, in that last um, before one plague, when there was a great darkness that came on the land, you couldn't see a hand in front of you. This is the word. It's a deep darkness, a physical darkness, but it also describes a spiritual darkness. When uh, w within you, where you perceive reality and truth, uh, you can't see a thing. It's a spiritual inner darkness and a darkness of understanding. And so it's also translated in the scripture for a, a dark, gloomy expression. It's the kind of thing when a person just, they look it, they walk it, their face expresses hopelessness, despair. And, and in the scripture, they use this word to describe such a countenance or face. It also it described in the scripture as a dangerous land. And so thick darkness, darkness outside, darkness inside that expresses itself on a face burdened down with despair, a darkness that is filled with danger. All those ideas are here. It, it also describes in the scripture, if we had an hour I could turn to all these scriptures, it describes the darkness of eyelids that are tired from weeping. When a person is so distraught and they weep until their eyes are puffed up and they can't see, it uses this word to describe eyelids, tired and darkened, you know, the dark rims under your eyes. Um, and as I've said, and let me say it again, a thick darkness, and it's used in the scripture to describe the darkness at the bottom of a mine. Now, I, I've got experience of this. When I was in uh, Johannesburg, South Africa, uh, someone took me down into the gold mine. You might have heard of the Kruger Gold. Well, uh, they had connections and they took me down into the bowels of the earth to the bottom of the Kruger Gold Mine. And I'd never been in any mine before. But uh, as I went down and the air became hotter and hotter as we got closer to the center of the earth, I suppose, and, and as we were going down, I uh, had a helmet with a light on it, and, and there in the passages underneath Johannesburg with our lights on, I was there in this mine. And my friend said, now turn off your light. I wanted to show you what darkness is. And I turned off my light. I have never in my life been in such darkness. I literally put my hand on the end of my nose and I couldn't see it. It was thick darkness. And that word is used in the scripture to describe the bottom of a mine. So you understand there's darkness and then there's darkness. And this is the deepest kind of darkness. Uh, it is used in the scripture to describe the abode of the dead. Uh, the Hebrew had little light on what happens after death. And they looked at the grave as the, the place of darkness, the abode of the dead. And, and this sort of tops it, it describes the darkness that was prior to the creation before God said, let there be light. Now, can, can you imagine that? This describes the darkness that was there before light was there. Okay, I think I've said enough. This word describes darkness as it is the strongest word in the Hebrew language to describe darkness. And David is described as being in a valley of this death darkness, or the shadow of death, the shadow of death. And, 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 and so you've got that picture. We're, we're talking about something that is as intense as it can get.
So, a valley, well, I think you know what a valley is. Valley is the low place surrounded by high mountains, ravine, and, and the, the mountains or sides of the ravine tower above. And if you've ever been in a real valley and you look up at the sides uh, of the ravine, there, there's a certain menace about it as if they could come crashing down upon you. And of course, those high sides to the valley that they blot out the sun except for a very short time of the day. Most of the day it's in a deep darkness under the shadow of the sun. And when the sun goes down, it's an impenetrable darkness in the valley. And if there is any light of the moon that might penetrate down into that valley, then it casts shadows that are their own problem. Because I think you know what I mean. Everything appears different after the sun goes down. Or I could switch it and say everything looks very different in the light. But in the dark, especially if there's a glimmer of light that causes shadows, then it's amazing. It's amazing what you can see in the dark that really isn't there. The, the darkness and its shadows produce grotesque monsters, creatures, movements. And at the bottom of a valley, oftentimes there would be mist. And the mist would move with the slightest breeze that came through the valley. And so there's movement, but of course it's the movement of air swirling the mists, the fog. And if there's any sound, it's exaggerated in the valley as it bounces off the walls of the ravine. And of course it's not a nice place, the bottom of a valley a deep valley hidden from the sun. It's a place where the very air is stale. It's, it's, it's got plants that grow there that grow nowhere else because they grow without the sun's rays upon them. It's dank and it's stale. It's moldy down there at the bottom. Dank, Dirty swamps and marshes can accumulate there. And it isn't so warm either. At the best of times down there at the bottom away from the sun. But at night it's unusually cold. I mean, do you get the picture here? You're, you're, you're essentially seeing nothing. And if you do see anything, it's some moving shadow that describe something that isn't there and the only sound you hear is the sound of your own feet and the feet of scurrying night creatures or an occasional shriek of a night bird. You know, cold, a, a terrible sense of alone, abandoned, it, it's the valley. And when you add to that the valley of the shade, the valley of the shadow, of deep darkness, death, all those words. David uses this expression. I think he uses it very deliberately um, because it was what he was going through at that time. And if You've only joined us tonight. David wrote this psalm when his own son Absalom was trying to kill him and take his throne. And David has had to evacuate Jerusalem and now he's basically a refugee and he's moving out into the eastern wilderness with just those that were faithful to him for the majority of his people have turned to Absalom. And so darkness of death, that's very real for David. Real possibility of physical death. Very, very real. But the word death, however you might use it, it's not always the end of physical life. Death is seen essentially as loss. 
Yeah, you've got to include in that idea loss in the sense it's the end. That is, there's no way out of this. When I say death, there, there's a, it's terminus. There, there's, uh, you, you, you're faced with something, you're not going to escape. Death. And, and so David is facing loss. Loss. Feel that word. And loss in the sense that there's no way out of this. There is no, no escape. This is the end. This is curtains. This is no way out. He's lost his home. Feel that. You know, David was in his 50s, maybe 60s. There's no way that we can really say. But we can work it out that David was approximately 50 to 60 something years old. And, and, and Jerusalem was not only his home, the place of the royal palace, the place where the Ark of the Covenant was. Not only that, but he had personally captured Jerusalem, made it his home, had built his home, had built the place for the ark, and now he's lost it. And his son is going to sit in his home, sleep in his bed, lay claim to all his possessions, everything that had the mark of David, the fingerprints of David, now will be Absalom's. And his bank account seized by Absalom, all his wealth has gone. And you might say his job, that's a strange way I suppose to talk about the king, but this was his job, his status in society, gone. And all the honor and the glory that went with it, all of which David had earned, by which I mean he wasn't born to the throne, he was born a shepherd lad, he was peasant class, and it was a marvel of God's purpose that he ends up being king. And so he's earned his way with the gift of God combined, and he's gone. I, I, I want you to feel this. Gone. I mean, he sat down to breakfast this morning as king over his people, king in his palace in Jerusalem, king who could walk amongst his possessions. And as the sun goes down, he's lost it all. It's gone. And he's fleeing across the mountain into the eastern wilderness, a refugee fleeing from the rage of his own son. He's been betrayed. The closest persons to him were all the time secretly planning with Absalom. David must have felt an absolute fool. It was happening right under his nose and he didn't know about it. And his closest, the, the name is very Eastern, Ahithophel, but if you can remember it, Ahithophel was David's closest counselor. That is, more than advisor as a position, Ahithophel was advisor to David, counselor to David, because they were friends. David describes them as going into the house of God together to worship. And now Ahithophel opens his hands and shows that he's been conspiring with Absalom all the time. And he, he's gone. He, he threw David out like trash, threw him under the bus. And David feels so stupid, he thought he was his friend. And, and not only stupid, but angry. He's been betrayed, stabbed in the back. All of that is going through his mind right now. This darkness that, that seems to claw at David, it's caused by bitter, angry people seeking revenge. That was Absalom. It had been building up for years, the hatred for his father. Now it, it, it's come of age, and he's going to get David and pay him back for being a bad father. 
And Ahithophel, he'd got his own reasons. It's a story all by itself. But deep in his heart, he had held a grudge against David and now going to get even. And all of them driven not only by bitterness and revenge, but they're driven by greed. They, they're drooling at the mouth. They can't wait to get their hands on David's property and home and money and so on and so on. Betrayal, betrayal. That word cuts you to the heart. Betrayal from his own son. Betrayal from those so close to him. Betrayal from Ahithophel, his, his counselor, may be even more so because under normal circumstances, whatever they now were, I don't know, but under normal circumstances at a time like this, he'd be counseling with Ahithophel, getting his advice. Ahithophel, who knew David's heart and knew the lay of the land, a wise man. Now, he's not only betrayed David, but there's got to be the question, what, what does he know about me? What, is he, what information has he taken to Absalom? Darkness, pressing. And then there's a possibility, and it's real possibility, although I, I, I would like to negate it as soon as I say it, but there's the possibility that there was lurking guilt in David's heart. His fall when he had the affair with Bathsheba and, and when uh, he's the instrument that brings about the death of Bathsheba's husband so he could marry, you know, that whole sordid scandal that's recorded in Scripture. Is he still, he, he called for forgiveness in Psalm 51. He received it, says Psalm 32. But at a time like this, is there a little rat in the basement that gnaws and said, this is your punishment? Darkness. And the fact is, he had been a sort of absentee father. Is he saying, what if I'd been a better father? If only I'd been a better father. Those things we don't know, but it's, it's very likely because those things do start bubbling up and say, now you're being punished. Now you're seeing what the judgment of God is. In that darkness, the shadow that is darker than anything you've seen before. And let's face it, did I say the death means it's over? It's finished. Well, you know, Absalom is not going to have a sudden change of heart. You, you can bet everything on that. Let's face it. As things looked at that moment, David was finished. It was curtains. The show is over. Even if he escaped death, and that's a big even if. Because, remember, this is the near Middle East at about 3,000 years ago. And in those days, as indeed to this very day in that crazy part of the world, uh, when one is coming to take the throne or take prime position of leadership, it's just understood in that neighborhood. You kill everybody that might oppose you. That's understood. That's what any wise person would do. And so David knows it. He can't just say, okay, Absalom, I'll give you the throne. No, Absalom, by nature of the culture, is committed to kill his father, get rid of the opposition. And even if David could live, he will be hunted like a refugee for the rest of his life, his life work, all his accomplishments, they have gone. In an hour, they've gone. He will never again be the anointed king of God's people. That's <clears throat> what we read 
from what David is going through right now. And if I could throw one more thing in, as far as darkness is concerned, there's an added gut-wrenching pain to all of this because he must defend himself against his own son. Which means that very likely left to his troops and the commander of his troops, General Joab, Absalom's going to die. And really, I mean, if Absalom's only got one intention, that's to get David and kill him, then uh, common understanding would be you've got to kill Absalom before he kills you. But that ripped David's heart. He would rather die than kill or have his own son killed. And, and he's already said to Joab, the general in command, please spare the young man. And Joab looked at him like he was crazy. Are you mad? Oh, yes. And then he speaks of something else in the darkness. He calls it evil. And really, evil is a, is a very, it's an umbrella word. It means that which is anti-life. Evil seeks to kill. It, it seeks to shred. It seeks to take apart life. I mean, physical life, mental life, emotional life, spiritual life, if it could. Uh, evil, it's, it's that energy of anti-God. An anti-God purpose. It's anti-human. It's anti-human society. And so it ever seeks to destroy peace, destroy unity, destroy harmony, produce chaos. Uh, one of those translations I read, they, they, they quote it as disaster. I, don't, I will not fear disaster. Well, yes, that's an okay translation. Just multiply it by a thousand or two. And lurking in the darkness of this valley he walked through, he felt every form of evil. And, and it's menacing and it's pressuring. It threatens destruction and chaos, loss, and death. Everything that David had had control over this morning is gone by this afternoon. He controls nothing. Nothing. He, he writes an, another psalm uh, that is from this time, only uh, this specifically was written not only about this time in general, but about his dear friend, Ahithophel, the man who betrayed him, Psalm 55. And there he writes, My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me. Horror has overwhelmed me. Okay, that's what we've been talking about. And I said, verse 6 of that psalm, And I said, Oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. Behold, I would wander far away. I would lodge in the wilderness. Well, I think every one of us have said words like that. Oh, for the wings of a dove. That I could get out of here. That, that, I, that I, life as I know it right now would stop being. The fact is, I am well aware that every one of you that I'm talking to right now, tonight and on the many other hours that we listen to around the world, in many other cultures and countries at this particular time in our history, this is not just an Old Testament story that you tell people in Sunday school. This has happened. Maybe it has happened to you in the last days, last weeks and months, when there's been a loss of job 
and, and it looks like the end. It looks like curtains. You've lost your home. And for some of you, that you were about the same age as David, and now you're like David. Where do you turn from here? And in it, the last months and years, you've lost money. Maybe you've lost your retirement, and you could make a case that David had lost his retirement. And others, which could happen at any time in anybody's history, but, but you've lost your children. You, you, your children have walked out on you. Some of you have lost your health and you've heard the doctor say, no hope, it's over, it's finished. Others of you know what betrayal is. You know the entrance of chaos into a situation where but a few hours ago was harmony and light. You, you understand what I mean? That this touches all of us. This that David went through is the common experience of every one of us. Now, the shadow, the shadow of death, this deep darkness which is described as shadow. There's a sinister suggestion here which I'll pick up on later, but let me give it to you here. Because shadow, this very same idea that's here, um, it, it's, it's elsewhere in Scripture. It's a covenant expression, which, which means to welcome someone into your home and give them covenant hospitality. It's used in Psalm 91 uh, of believers who in, are in the secret place of the Most High, who dwell in the shadow of of the Almighty. That means you come into the Almighty's house, into his home to share all that he has. And, and uh, as I say, it's a covenant expression. If a person is in need, you bring them under the shadow of your roof. Do you, do you understand that word is used here only in a, a terrible and sinister, horrific way, as if the deep darkness of death is opening its hands to you and saying, come and be my guest, I'll give you everything I've got. It's, it, there's a, a seduction here, there's a luring, a sucking into the darkness. To be lost inside of the darkness. It's as if you're passing by a black hole that's sucking you in. Put that on hold for a moment. And back to, shall I say, the real and regular usage of the word shadow. Because what I've just said is a specific usage, um, a covenant usage. But the word shadow, a shadow is a shadow. And this is the valley of the shadow of death. It is not the valley of death. Or, to put it another way, this is not death valley. You see, a shadow, when all is said and done, however fearful shadows can be, a shadow is not ultimately real. A shadow ultimately doesn't have the substance that makes it real, reality. Or as someone has said, the shadow of a dog has never bitten anybody, though the shadow can be frightening. Shadows may threaten, shadows may seem and appear to be real, but they do not have the power to accomplish what they threaten. Uh, that's good that David brings that idea in. He says, what I'm facing now is the deepest darkness that I could ever describe. What I'm facing right now has got death woven into every moment. But he said, it's the shadow. It's the shadow. Oh, hear that. This valley is but the shadow of the darkness of death. 
And then he says, I will fear no evil. You see, the shadow, the evil, they take on solid substance when they are believed in and accepted as reality. Or, going back to what I said a moment ago, when this darkness of death and loss and finished and you're over and it's hopeless, when it sucks at you and you believe that it has power to do what it threatens, then you are sucked into its reality. And David says, I will fear no evil. And he's obviously shouting that down through the valley and it echoes off the walls of the ravine. I will fear no evil. And please understand, this is not David whistling in the dark. You know what I mean. Whistle a happy tune um, because you're scared spitless. And so you whistle and you sing in a quavering voice. Try and give yourself courage. No, that, that, that's, this isn't thinking positive thoughts. This isn't having a private conversation with yourself and saying, cheer up, everything will be okay tomorrow. No, Absalom will be here tomorrow. No, that, under most circumstances, that's pretty ridiculous. But under these circumstances, it is utter insanity. No, his statement, I will fear no evil, is on a foundation that cannot be moved. And to turn the illustration, um, at this time it's as if a tornado of evil, a, a spinning darkness has come into David's life. Well, he's shouting down that valley that he's in a house that cannot be moved by the darkness or by its seduction or by its sucking horror. He hurls into the darkness the final truth, the final absolute reality of covenant union that cannot be moved. He said, I will fear no evil for or because, that is, I'm not just saying, I won't be afraid of evil, I won't be afraid of evil. He's not confessing something till he's blue in the face and hope it happens. No, he is declaring, I am on a foundation that cannot be moved. I, I will fear no evil because, for, you are with me. And your rod and your staff, they comfort me or they pour strength into me. You are with me. You see, the word with, we use it so casually today. But the word with in, in the scripture is a covenant word. It, it's a very strong word describing union. It, 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 it means to be joined together in covenant. It means to be held by a love that will not let me go. It means to be held within the faithfulness of the covenant partner. When he says, you, shepherd, you are with me, he was saying we are bonded together by the covenant blood. We are bonded together by your faithfulness. You cannot let me go with, with. Tremendous word, tremendous. In fact, you might remember that the Hebrew people used this word every day, many times a day. It was their form of greeting one another. The Lord be with you. That's how they greeted one another. The Lord be with you. And the response, or the, the second half of that was, and the Lord bless you. And so it was saying, it was announcing to each other on the way to work, you are 
covenant person. He is bound to you. And the response is yes. And because of that we are blessed of the Lord. So David is referring to that here. He says, uh, I, I know what I see. I, I know what my senses report. I know what my brain and my intellect come up with in its logic. But they've all left out the one changing statement, and that is, the Lord is with me. And therefore, I will fear no evil. It's such a strong word. It's, it's used of Jesus used of Jesus in a twofold way. Remember in John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word. That's Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. With there, it means a bond. It could be in that particular scripture, cheek to cheek, face to face. It means the closest bond that love can imagine. Joined together as God the Father is joined in the Holy Spirit to God the Son with. And then it says that God the Son in that union with Father and Spirit took flesh and became human without ever leaving that union and of that one who was born of the Virgin Mary you shall call his name Emmanuel which means if you translate the word Emmanuel it means God with us and so do you see it he is with the Father with the Spirit and now he has come and joined to our humanity humanness that we might be with him in his with the Father and with the Spirit. What a thought. What a thought. No wonder. And David is referring to this. I know because it comes out of the book of Deuteronomy. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Says the Lord. You see. Do, do you see? He is. I mean, it's reality. You can't, well, all that I, I've just said about that darkness of death, it's reality. But what I've just said about the Lord is with you in it, that's reality spelled in caps. You see, there's reality, but then there's reality. And reality, we're not denying what's going on. We're merely, we're stepping up to a greater reality that's over, in, and under what you can see reality. And I don't care what is happening. I don't have to deny it. I just have to hurl into its heart the greater reality that in the middle of this, you are with me. I fear no evil. You see, the temptation, hear me again, the temptation behind all presentation temptations. Well, you know what I mean? Temptations come in many faces. You're tempted to this, you're tempted to that, tempted to that. But really and truly, there's only one temptation. It's got many faces, which I call presentation temptations. But the real temptation is to yield surrender to the shadow. Yield, surrender to this ethereal, lying, deceitful black hole that says, I have power over you. You yield to that. You believe it. That's what's behind every temptation. It's that sigh of hopelessness, the sigh of despair, and it yields. You've heard people. No, I'm, I mean, yeah, I, I, I've been in, in this valley. And have you ever said the words, I'd rather be dead than fill in the blank? What, whatever loss, that is, if I lost this or lost that, or I'd rather be dead. That, that, that sliding, you're, you're feeling the suction of darkness. 
It's yielding to the darkness. Darkness has won. It's over. And what's ahead of me is unthinkable. I'd rather be dead. No. Fling it like a divine sword into the gut of this monster. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And that's a hope. That's the only hope on the planet and in the universe. This is hope. This is expectancy. Expectancy in the God who has covenanted with us. And without that hope, then indeed this death shadow takes form and substance and real power. He says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And as he said, you're with me. And like a little sheep, he looks up and he sees hanging on the belt of the shepherd is a rod. What's a rod? Well, maybe it's a weapon. It could be a weapon as, um, what? One of the martial arts might use a stick. But most of the time, this rod was <clears throat> carved off a tree, a big limb of a tree, and carved into a club. And now the shepherd was an expert user. That, that was his method of warfare. He had two. One, one was his slingshot, and the other was his club. And he wasn't just, I mean... He's not Swiler wailing the club. Rather, he knows how to use it. Huh. Fight off every predator, whether it be a human being or a sheep enemy. Help those enemies if the shepherd ever draws on that club. And the little sheep looks at that swinging club as they walk together through the valley. And he says, your rod, it comforts me. I'm protected whatever those shadows are suggesting, whatever those noises I hear in this dank, foul mud that I'm putting my feet in now. I know you are covenantally bound to me and your club is my covenant club. And your staff, the word staff means support of every kind. But the staff essentially was that, uh, would you understand if you come from a farming area, the crook, it's, it's a long pole with a hook on the end, used specifically by shepherds, and, and, and it was high, tall, and, and, and the sheep could see it, and the, it was the guide. As you saw the shepherd, as he walked, he would hold that staff. And the sheep could see the staff, and it was they, they followed the staff. It was their guide as they walked along. If they fell into a ditch, he would switch it around and pull them out by putting the hook around them and yanking them out. And so the staff was that comfort. It guides me through impossible places, and if I trip, it just hooks me back on my feet again. He says, you're with me, covenantally with me, your great club and your guiding staff. They, they comfort me. And notice what he said. He said, I, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Walk. That's quite a word, you know. Walk. First of all, I know some people who they've never really gotten down to asking who God is. And so that they've invented this magic God. You know, just get me out of here. As if he's going to whack you with a Harry Potter wand and woo, it's all gone away. And then they get very upset with God and say, how could you allow this? Because it's magic, you see. Well, of course, that's not the God of the Bible. Um, he walks with us through the valley. Walk, walk. If he is with me, I walk. Walk. Walk when there's no logical way through. But I walk. And I walk through. They have marvelous words, you know. Walk. Through. 
it, it, it means that I don't run in, in panic, fear. It can do strange things to you. It produces this adrenaline rush, but it's panic and anxiety and worry and despair and hopelessness. And we just run and we run blindly. We're terrified and we crash into the rocks. We sprawl over them into the mud and we hit the branches of the tree and we fall into holes because we're in a panic and we don't know what we're doing. We're just going to get out of here. No. I will fear no evil. And so we walk, me and the shepherd, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, step by step by step. And because he's the shepherd, he's the center of light. And therefore he casts his light upon the rocks in the way and the holes and the branches. And we walk in peace and in safety and we go through it, through it. It comes to an end. It's a marvelous thing. It's true. What, what do I say to persons that are right in the middle of this right now? Very quickly. And I, as I say, we're going to pick right up on this next week. But let me give you a very quick, because I think you've picked up a lot already anyway. But in the evil day, as Paul calls this in Ephesians 6, the evil day, what does he say? Fasten the belt of truth. I, I would, if I could get a hold of you right now, I'd shake you and say, put on the belt of truth. Because if there's one thing in the valley of deep darkness, in its moving shadows, in its sucking threat of death and loss, the one thing about that valley is lies, 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 and deceit. Realize the truth. Or as Paul says, the most important part of your armor as a believer is the belt of truth. What is the truth? You have it a thousand times better than David. And that's not Malcolm, that's Hebrews. The book of Hebrews says we are under a better covenant. And Jesus said of this age in which we live, called the age of the Holy Spirit, he said, it is better for you that I go away so that the Holy Spirit may come. We are in a better better covenant. Can you imagine? You are in something better than David ever knew. Better, better. And what is it? Jesus said of the Holy Spirit, He is with you. He shall be in you. That's better. The truth, the truth, the final truth, this shepherd is not only with you, but he became human and by the Holy Spirit is at this moment in the middle of your valley. He is in you totally sharing your experience and he is your strength. And of course, where Jesus, the Son of God, is, there is the Father and there is the Spirit. You cannot split up the Holy Trinity. And therefore... If you can hear me, there are four persons walking through this valley. There is the I Am, who is Father, Abba, Daddy, Son, Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, and you. And you are in Him, and He is in you. Huh. I mean... Can, can, can you grasp this? This is the truth. And the Holy Spirit within you now at this moment, He is the personal God strength that has been made yours through Jesus by the delight of the Father. Strength to walk in step. Strength. Ability. To walk in step with Jesus the Son and with Abba. 
he joins you into the circle of divine love right at this moment in the midst of your darkness stop time out realize the truth realize the truth and declare it to him directly you are with me you will never leave me nor forsake me and he declared it he says it I mean he didn't think this he said it it's written down and we're reading it 3,000 years later declare the truth declare it in the face of seduction of darkness that wills you to believe that the darkness is the only reality. Hurl this into the curses that men have said over you when they've pronounced you've only got so long to live. And when you look at a tangled mess of what you have lost, hurl this into it and say so. You know, the book of James says that our tongue is the rudder by which the ship is steered. We say so. We say so. And in choosing to deliberately, intentionally rest into the reality of the great shepherd, we find that we walk through and in walking through, everything was restored to David. And the testimony of Scripture is that when we walk through the valley, in with the shepherd and he in us, there is a restoration of something greater than we lost. Anyway, I can't say any more tonight. I've gone over time. Um, but next week we're going to continue this. And we shall get to that which some of you have been waiting for, which is that word imagination. Because this is where it fits in. <clears throat> so we're going to come and redo this text. Get where we didn't get tonight. <clears throat> and also speak about Holy Spirit-filled imagination. Well, um, I think we can spend some time now... Um, Okay, I did it. So, as I've said before, keep your questions and sharing to what we're talking about, and um, I'll try and read them all. Malcolm, is there any way we can avoid going through the valley of the shadow of death in our life, or is it part of our life experience designed by Papa? And I come into experience and to know him. Um, let's put it like this, Cindy. It's no. Um, number one, we can't avoid it. Although we do pray, lead us not into the trials. We never look for it. But it, on the other hand, let me say, as far as what you've just said there, um, it wasn't designed by the Lord. The Lord does not design evil. He, he, he is not the sculptor of the darkness. This, this is the way things are. He has invaded earth. He has joined our humanness. And now from within our humanness, from within the fallenness of this race, he is establishing his kingdom. Um, and he is triumphing over the darkness. And he's doing it in you. So when you face the valley of the shadow of death, it's not because he designed it, nor have you done something to get yourself into it. It's the way life is. But everything that comes into your life, he who is your life, he who is your Abba, he who is the Son of God who loves you, gave himself for you, he who is the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, joining you to the Father and the Son, um, He will use everything in your pathway to reveal His faithfulness to you, have it embedded, etched into you, and in you and through you 
to bring about the kingdom of God in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death. And um, my experience, Nancy's experience, our experience together says a wholehearted amen to that. And yet there's not one thing there that I would ever dream of saying that it was designed by God, as if in some maliciousness he designed the valley. Rather, because we live in the world we live in, then inevitably every one of us comes to something like this in life, sometimes more than one thing. We, we've been through more than one valley. In fact, in, in one sense, the, the last weeks and months have been something of such a valley for us in a totally other kind of way. Uh, Father didn't design that, but when, when he joined our humanness, he committed himself to walk through with us, in us, what humans experience, only now to do so with his strength, his faithfulness to covenant, and to reveal himself in this, and for us, in him, through him, by him, to establish the kingdom of God in the midst of it. Okay, apart from that, it will become another whole webinar. Eric, in the valley, does David walk through with his primary reliance on faith and hope in God, or with his primary reliance on his prior track record of experience with God? Good question, Eric. The fact is, the two go together. My faith, my hope in God, is based on the revelation that God has given me in Jesus, but that is undergirded by all the times in my life when I have had cause and privilege to prove that. And so on, in a dark day, at this time in my Christian life, I not only trust in the Jesus, in the Father, in the Spirit, who has been revealed to me through the Scripture, through the person of Jesus, but also I have got a long track record that goes back to my teenage that I'm still here and I'm sitting here filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the joy of the Lord and the peace of God. I'm here and that's my track record. I forget not all his benefits. And so it's not either or, it's both. And therefore, the longer you walk in God, the more track record you have that it is a, a sort of picture on the wall, if you like. It's a, a, it's a your, your memorial on your shelf that, yeah, everything he said he is, he is. I proved it there, I proved it here, I proved it there. And I would suggest to all of you that you, you take time to, um, you, you, you take time to ma make a book, write, write down all the times of God's faithfulness to you, the little tiny things and the big things. Um, it stands good in times of trial. Um, and of course, yeah, Cindy, he was, yeah, I, I should have brought the two together there, you did it here, that it was the shadow of death calling him, and he refuses to believe in that, that, that it, ha it had no essential reality, no substance, but rather he came and declared himself to be under the shadow of the Almighty. Okay. Sue, Malcolm, I lost my job over a year ago, put my life in God's hands to bring me new employment. He hasn't yet. Things are getting worse every day. When do I take things into my own hands? Uh, okay, so um, I've got to say this succinctly. So um, don't take this in any way negatively. But you see that last sentence, when do I take things into my own hands? The fact is, your hands and his hands are one. Uh, a few webinars ago, I, I said you can never think of yourself as separate from or independent from him. So you are Sue Jesus. He is Jesus Sue. You are one. And therefore, 
for me to live, said Paul, is Christ. You, you are one and you can never be separated. Therefore, I'm not sure what you mean by take things into your own hands, but whatever you mean by it, it means that his hands are in your hands and for you to take things into your own hands is for his hands to become involved. Um, if it means that you start taking deliberate action to find a job or do something that you would like to do or whatever, uh, you can be sure that that urgency, that want to that's inside of you, that I think I'll do this, I think I'll do that, is he thinking. And, and I would say to everybody, don't wait for some heavenly thing to float and drop in your lap, but rather get what I've just said to Sue that if you don't have a job, you go out and look for a job, for it is Christ in you, walking in you, into the job market. And if there's a, a something rises within you, a creative urge to do this or do that, it's Christ in you, thinking your thoughts, for you and He are one. Now really, that should be a whole hour, um, but I hope you can at least milk that a bit, okay? Aha, Brandon, is there anything we can make this journey through the valley shorter? Nope. Um, I can tell you this, though, that if you've got a hold of what I've just said and get a hold of what I will say next week, um, the, the burden of the valley will not be the same. Um, in that Psalm 55, uh, that I quoted from David, written at this same time. He, he says in that same Psalm 55, cast your burden on the Lord. And the fact is, the, the, the essence of the burden and the horror and the sucking maliciousness of the valley, once I've realized he's my shepherd, he's with me, and I cast it upon him, then really the... The hurtful pain of the valley is, is taken out of it. And so it doesn't get shorter. It will be as long as it will be. And he can make it shorter, but I'm no, there's no, see, you're not controlling God. I, I know if you thought you confess stuff long enough, you might control him, but you don't control God, nor do you control life. So that's the whole essence of the Christian life. You give yourself into his hands. And yes, I've known him to make a valley shorter. But as I look back on life, valleys end when valleys are supposed to end. And you come into the place of fullness and realize that he not only was with you, but now he has so restored. Um, but the valley can be, Jesus said, my uh, burden, my load is easy, my burden is light, because if, if he's carrying it in me, then um, you, you can understand it. it's not the same. Okay, Brenda, David must have received God's grace to be able to turn away from the seduction of darkness, despair, and human reason. Yeah, the psalm that we are going through inch by inch this psalm is the grace that was given to David. And through David, by the Holy Spirit, through Jesus, is now given to us as an even better, grander grace than David had. But yes, yeah, again, you see, you have to understand, grace is not some odd thing that happens sometimes. You and I, we live in the continual flow of the grace of God. What I'm doing tonight is the grace of God. And one can never think of being alive and living apart from the grace of God. The fact you went to work today uh, was the grace of God. The, the fact that you can have hope and peace if you didn't go to work today is the grace of God. It's all the grace of God. What we have to do is recognize that he and I are one, this grace is, and now begin to act as if that's true. Okay. Uh, 
Woodsy, I feel so upset over my son isolating himself from us because of his mental problems. Incidentally, we're praying for that son. As a mum, I feel such sadness inside. How can I apply this? By giving your son totally into the hands of the shepherd, the shepherd, and in this sense I say Father and Son and Holy Spirit, the I Am, and I, I want to say this very, very carefully underlined in red, he loves your son more than you do. He loves your son where your love cannot penetrate through that mental illness. Your son is held in the embrace of the Holy Trinity, who is at work in him and his mind and emotions right as we speak. And therefore, give your son into the hands of the Trinity, or as Psalm 55 says, casting your care upon him, and then dare to thank God that that is so, and begin every time your son comes to mind to thank the Father, thank Jesus, thank the Holy Spirit. You are now working in my son's life and mind and emotions. And you will find the joy of the Lord and the peace of God begins to take over. And let me warn you ahead of time, that will feel illegal. You will feel as though you should not have joy and giving thanks. And you will feel that you shouldn't be at peace. That's why it's called the peace of God that passes human understanding, comprehension. If your son is in the hands of the Holy Trinity, then you say amen to that. Yield to it. Say, my son is in your hands. Now spend the rest of this period of time that you're going through, spend it giving thanks that the Holy They are at work in divine love in his heart and mind in that darkness that outside of the light of God he's in right now. Please, please do that and you, you will find um, th this miracle, is there another word for it, of joy in the midst of a, a where, where joy cannot be, but it is. As, as you you just continually reiterate the truth. Thank you, Father. You're at work in his life. You are. We, we're going to keep... We're, we're joining the Holy Trinity in the name of Jesus. That, that son will be restored to perfect health. Okay, Jeffrey. How do we practically make the switch from the negative mindset of the valley to agreeing with him? Experiencing the deliverance in our hearts and minds. I've often said it. And I don't know a better way, though people do get upset with me, when I say, act as if it's true. I, I mean, Jeffrey, everything I've said tonight, I think that most of the people here would say that's true. Well, if it's true, how do we make the switch? Well, it's true. So... To get over that wretched bump in your mind that stands there saying, what's the switch? When there is no switch, it's true. But maybe it helps people to act as if it's true and find out it is. So to all of you, I, I say from the end of this webinar on through tonight into tomorrow, I challenge you, act as if you really are the child of the Father in whom he delights. Act as if Jesus the Son lives inside of you. You are filled with the Holy Spirit. Act as if it's true. You say, well, I don't feel anything. I say this very reverently, to hell with your feelings. Your feelings got you into trouble in the first place. Feelings always come staggering along behind. They're always lost in the procession. Faith 
is acting as if he's faithful, acting as if he's everything he said he is. And do, as I just told um, Woodsy Mom, do it. Declare it. Thank you, Father. You're in me. You're with me. Thank you. You are now working in this darkness to reverse the loss, to reverse the evil and death. Thank you that you are now opening doorways to a job. Many times our prayers are whining. They're complaints in religious disguise. No. Okay. Sue, fabulous answer. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sue. That, that means a lot to me. Okay. Uh, okay, sewing, uh, yeah, I think I've just said it, worshipping through the darkness does help. More than that, <laughs> worshipping through the darkness is the destruction of the darkness. Satan cannot stand joy. Satan cannot stand giving of thanks and singing praise to God. So, yes, Russell, I've been in many, many valleys. The answer is always the same. Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit. Right on, Russell. That's what Jesus did in the ultimate, when he really went into death beyond the shadow. With Jesus, uh, quickly, Gethsemane was the shadow of death. The cross was death. And in, he entered into death itself by saying, into your hands I commit my spirit came out the other end as I am he that lives I was dead I am alive forevermore so that as we go through the valley committed our spirit to him that we never really taste death okay Cindy uh, act as if again um, okay thank you Woodsy his name is Joe now we know who we're praying for um, Tom, can we learn from other people's walk through their valley? Up to a point. You'll, you'll know I am very slow to give my testimony to certain parts of my life. But for one reason, people try to copy it. And then they get all upset that it didn't or isn't working the same way for them as it did for me. And so I, I can share and other people can share with you what happened to them but zero in on how he was faithful to them. Um, not on the particulars, not on the uniqueness of their experience, because their experience is theirs, not yours. And um, so, yeah, I, I do listen to other people's experience, but I, I, I don't bother so much with how it happened to them or how they felt in it. That's personal to them, but I do hear that he was faithful. He came through. That, that's why the Bible is full of stories uh, of people. Um, Eric, what's the difference between acting as if and pretense? Pretense is when it isn't true. You're pretending it's true. I say act as if because it is true. A and I suppose you could make a case uh, of we, we, we are what I'm talking about right now, I suppose, I'm thinking out loud, you could turn this whole thing for 24 or 48 hours into a game of let's pretend Jesus is alive, you know. That's just to get over our stupid thick brains, try and fool them, um, uh, uh, acting as if. But really and truly, if you're going to get down to it, if you're pretending, you are pretending to be who you're not. Where I'm saying is, for goodness sake, start acting as if you are who you are. Okay. Um, colony. Jesus walked through the valley of not the shadow, yeah, but death itself. Conquered death. So any shadow of death we face is a defeated shadow of a conquered death. That's a beautiful phrase. I'm going to remember that. A defeated shadow of a conquered death. Right on, Colony. Right on. Um... Years ago, I had to take your advice about God loving my son more than I did. Later, I received a letter from you that said, Only God can soften a heart on the outside of the letter. Uh, amen. I've said that to a lot of people. Okay. Uh, is acting as if really the practical way? We Yes. I mean, if you... 
uh, as I say, people do get very upset when I say that for some reason, but um, it, it's simple. You know, I, I've often said, how did Peter get out of the boat and walk on water? Have you ever thought of that? If you're in a boat in the middle of the lake, how do you get out of the boat to walk on the water? Normally, if you're getting out of a boat in the middle of the lake, you go head first. Or you take a jump. But if you're getting out of the boat to walk on the water, you put one leg over the side expecting to hit something solid. And then you bring the other leg over, putting all your weight on the first leg. Okay, he acted as if Jesus' word was true. That's all I'm saying. This is no big secret. It's nothing weird. It's just... Is the scripture true? Is the revelation of the Father in the face of Jesus true? Is he with you? Is he in you? Is that true? You see, in many of your churches, I know that they mouth it's true and then go off to start giving you a load of do this, do that, do the other, and then it will be true. What I'm saying is scrap the do's and don'ts and ifs and thens and dare to get up from your seat in front of this computer and start acting as if it's true. Okay. Uh, Peg, it was my acting as if that taught me the reality of his truth. Thank you, Peg. Acting as if really works. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Peg. Um, acting as if is walking by faith in what... Amen, that's what I'm saying, Lexi. Um... How, act, isn't acting as if how we yes you see as I say this is just a, a way that I have found of helping people to do all of these things instead of just walking around and around it okay I think we've come to the end and so let us now pray and receive the blessing Father we give you thanks for the final, absolute reality of the words that we have said and shared this night. And I now call your blessing upon every person that is in this room. I call this blessing upon them because it is true. And therefore, because it is true, I can declare it so over them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That from this hour they shall go into life in the strength of who you are, speaking your word and life into the darkness and walking on into a path that grows brighter and brighter into the perfect day. So I give your blessing and declare that is the way it is. Amen. And see you next week.